Thank you, uh, Dean Allison. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Anatolian Heritage Foundation, or Federation President uh, Saratin uh, uh, Bey. Uh, my thanks to uh, Ahmed Timurche, uh, who helped us uh, for the last two months with our logistics. We appreciate the assistance very much, Ahmed Bey. Uh, and a special welcome to my friend, His Excellency the Ambassador from Turkey to Canada, Tunçay Babli. Good to see you here in this capacity. Uh, and a special welcome to the members of the Turkish Grand National Assembly uh, who are with us today, uh, the Honorable Sadiq Baba, the Honorable uh, Rachai Berber, the Honorable Mehmet Mush, all from the uh, AK Party, the Honorable Kadir Oud from uh, CHP, and the Honorable Oktay Ozturk from MHP. Welcome, gentlemen. Now I've been asked to speak about Turkey and Turkey and its region from an American perspective and to explain why, despite its several problems, Turkey remains an outstanding choice for trade and investment. I'm not going to presume that in the process I can capture either the tone or the substantive importance of the Canadian-Turkish relationship. I simply don't have that kind of insight into the relationship. But I will presume that several of the considerations that are important to U.S.-Turkey relations also inform Canadian-Turkish interests. And I hope to explain why, despite some problems and concerns, you too should conclude that there are enormous and promising opportunities for much greater commercial relations between Canadian and Turkish corporations. Now, do I signal a, a change or do I use the clicker here? I got an answer to that, okay. I found no evidence that Prime Minister Harper and Prime Minister Erdogan enjoy a personal relationship, and certainly not one as close and thick as that between President Obama and Prime Minister Erdogan. Rather, I found evidence that official relations have sometimes been quite troubled. In fact, the website for Turkey's Ministry of Foreign Affairs candidly states that the Canadian position on what it calls, quote, the events of 1915 in line with the Armenian allegations, end quote, have had negative repercussions on official relations, overshadowed other aspects of the relationship, and caused economic relations to lag behind their true potential. While the U.S. has on several occasions also struggled with the Armenian genocide issue, that has not been the case since 2010. When Prime Minister Erdogan visited Washington in mid-May for two days of discussions with President Obama and the, leadership's, uh, senior leader, and the administration's senior leadership, the adjective universally used in Ankara and Washington to describe the relationship was excellent quote unquote, probably the best in two decades. But, 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 I hear you saying. We're now in December and a lot has happened since May. What about Syria? The UN says that more than 110,000 have been killed in this civil war right on Turkey's borders. 600 have been reportedly killed in just the past three days. And Turkey says it is accommodating more than 600,000 refugees in its camps and dispersed in cities in Hatay and along the southern border. Or what about the street protests this past summer in Istanbul and Ankara? The government itself said that there are more than three and a half million protesters in 80 of Turkey's 81 provinces. What about the fight against the PKK and the stalled Kurdish peace initiative? What about the trials of Turkey's military? And what about the concerns for Turkey's historically cyclical boom and bust economy? I'm going to tackle the last one first, because were it not for a strong Turkish economy for the past 11 years, we wouldn't be speaking about any of the rest. It begins with a rarity in Turkish pol political life more than a decade of stable, majority government. 
That means no need to water down policy to satisfy coalition partners and an ability to craft an economic course and stick with it. Here you can see that the government of Prime Minister Erdogan has increased its voters' appeal in each of the three elections it contested, favored by just under 50% of the electorate in 2011. This slide graphically illustrates the transformation of the Turkish economy and the improvement in the wealth and the welfare of most, but certainly not all, Turks since the AK party came to power in 2002. As with much of Turkey's political life, we find polarization in people's satisfaction with the economic direction of the country. The Pew Research Center recently came up with an interesting cross-cutting cross sampling that simultaneously found a relationship among issues of politics, piety, and the economy. It found that 67% of those who pray rarely are dissatisfied with the overall economic direction of the country, while 64% of those who pray five times a day are satisfied. A snapshot of some of these macroeconomic numbers today illustrates that Turkey's economic progress continues, even though there are genuine concerns that deserve our and Turkey's careful attention. For example, the current account deficit, inflation, unemployment, now focus for a moment on the current account deficit. Forget what you've heard in the past about the importance of the BRICS. The latest hot button issue in international finance is the Fragile Five. Brazil, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and Turkey. Each an emerging economy with current account deficit problems and a currency regarded as unusually vulnerable to hot money investments. Economies that are presumed to be okay as long as the U.S. Federal Reserve maintains its soft money policy, but presumed vulnerable when the Fed starts tapering its $85 billion a month bond buying. So Turkey's long-time, long-standing, weakest macro number, the current account deficit, is today the data point drawing greatest international economy attention. <clears throat> in recent meeting of senior U.S. and Turkish leadership, including the main meeting in Washington to, between Erdogan and Obama, it's been agreed to focus attention on enlargement of the bilateral commercial relationships, particularly the trade relationship, so that the tiny economic relations begin to more closely match the size and the strength of our foreign and national security relations. And it was also agreed that the economic leadership in both capitals would pay attention to the U.S. and the EU free trade agreement and negotiations to assure that Turkey would not be victimized by the terms of agreement. Let me introduce at this point some data about Canadian Turkish trade and investment. Total bilateral trade in 2012 was $2.3 billion in value, $850 million of that in manufactured goods, primarily iron and steel scrap, minerals, fuels exported from Canada to Turkey, $1.5 billion in Turkish goods imported into Canada, primarily automotive pro products, gold and hazelnut. In other words, approximately a two-to-one advantage for Turkey in its terms of trade between Canada and, uh, uh, and Turkey. But here's the important comparison. In 2012, Canada had a global trade value of $917 billion. That means that the world's number 11 economy, Canada, and the number 17 economy, Turkey, have a trading relationship that amounts to less than one-fourth of one percent of Canada's global trade value. In other words, of the 400 trading dollars, Canadian trading dollars, only one of those is dedicated to trade between Turkey and uh, Canada. So the point that was made in Washington in May is equally valid in, in Ottawa. 
There is a need to focus attention on enlargement of the bilateral commercial relationship, particularly the trade relationship, so that economic relations begin to more closely match the size and the importance of your foreign and national security relations. And for those of you who may be interested in the trading relationship between Canada and other Eurasian uh, Turkic uh, uh, countries, let me just mention that between Canada and Kazakhstan, there was actually a somewhat better uh, trading relationship in 2012, $3.2 billion worth of, of trade, uh, 2.9 of that 3.2 exports from Canada to Kazakhstan. Azerbaijan was $1.3 billion, and all of the other Turkic states were all but insignificant, ranging from $50 million with Turkmenistan to just $4 million with Tajikistan. Once the poster child of its widely heralded no problems with neighbors policy, Syria is today a sharp reminder that sometimes the neighbors have their own ideas. A quarter of a million Syrians are in refugee camps along the Turkish border. Another 400,000 are scattered across Turkey, living with relatives and friends, or for those with resources, renting apartments, even setting up businesses. Refugees have imposed a budgetary strain of at least $2 billion on the Turkish economy, but Turkey is managing with some international support. The International Red Cross found that the refugee camps in Turkey are among the best they have ever inspected. Turkey lost an Air Force jet to Syrian fire two years ago. It shot down a Syrian helicopter in September. There have been cross-border shellings and missile strikes. Turkey, after all, expected that the al-Assad regime would collapse in months. It didn't. There is today worry over the spillover of the fighting and special anxiety for the proven use of chemical weapons. Turkey is on board with the U.S.-Russia-Syria Chemical Weapons Agreement, but it does not agree that the focus on chemical weapons is sufficient, pointing out that most of the civilian deaths are due to conventional weapons. Frankly, Turkey wishes that the U.S. had followed through in September with a military response that degraded the Damascus regime's conventional capabilities. Yet Turkey will take no unilateral measures on its own, and to date, there has been remarkably little negative consequence inside Turkey for the fighting in Syria. In times of increased national security concerns, Turkey turns to its NATO alliance partners, and particularly the United States, including deployment to southern Turkey of Dutch, German, and American Patriot anti-missile batteries, a deployment that was just renewed by NATO for an additional year. A small and overwhelmingly peaceful protest in Istanbul in late May became the inspiration for national demonstrations in June and July, largely because of the heavy-handed throttling of the protesters by the police. The government was taken by surprise. Indeed, most Turks were taken by surprise because they had not experienced anything like it in more than a decade. It reflected the frustration of a sizable minority for its inability to freely express dissenting views and to peacefully petition government for redress of its grievances. But it was not Turkey's version of the Arab Spring, which is a good time for me to make a critical observation. Turkey is a constitutional, secular democracy. It holds free and fair elections on a regular basis. It's a valued member of the NATO alliance, and it's a candidate for EU membership. The protests in Turkey press for changes in the government's behavior, not the overthrow of the government itself. The cities are today, with rare exception, quiet. And the political jockeying is moving from the streets to the political campaigns as Turkey steps up to local and presidential elections in 2014. Trials of the military have been ongoing for more than five years. Two major high-profile trials have concluded with more than 550 guilty verdicts for coup plotting, resulting in lengthy prison terms for the arrestees, most of them retired military officers. 
The cases have been appealed, and there is considerable evidence that some of the indictments are based on problematic evidence. But the essential point is neither the trials nor the outcome. The essential point is that the Turkish military remained in its barracks, and its response to the trials clearly demonstrated that the practice of Turkish military tutelage is passed, and the military is now fully answerable to the political leadership. In recent weeks, frustration mounted among the Kurdish population as well that the promised political reforms have not materialized. A new package of reforms was submitted by the government as parliament reconvened on October 1. The Kurdish political party and its military arm, the PKK, are far from satisfied with the package of democratic reform. But most importantly, the 11-month ceasefire is holding and has the prospect of becoming Turkey's new norm. So once again, why Turkey? And the answer is political stability, a strong economy, a young, plugged-in population, a NATO ally and NATO standards, sufficient resources, ample past experience, and enormous opportunity. Assertions of Islam light to the contrary it is a secular democracy with a stable government. Historically and consistently, elections have been free and fair. And in the coming 18 months, we will see three elections, local elections in March of 2014, and for the first time, direct election of the president in August of 2014, and in 2015, nationwide parliamentary elections. While the outcomes, of course, are not clear, clear Current polling indicates that the Prime Minister's AK party holds a considerable lead. Turkey is a friend and an ally whose military now responds to civilian political authority and no longer gives government political direction. The Turkish military has made truly meaningful force contributions in Kosovo, Libya, Somalia, and Afghanistan. In transportation, energy, and healthcare infrastructure, in mining, private sector education, start again, in transportation, energy and healthcare infrastructure, in mining, private sector education, natural stone and ceramic tiles, in insurance, in national defense, in construction, design and engineering, the commercial opportunities in Turkey are enormous. American industry can be competitive for any and all of this and I am confident Canadian industry can be as well. But it does have to compete. It has to compete in price, of course, but also in technology transfer and the share of local industry participation. The days of Western countries building and Turkey buying are long since over. And the government of Canada needs to com complete the, the legal underpinnings that provide an environment for commercial success. <coughs> Things like a foreign investment promotion and protection agreement, and things like a science and technology agreement. <clears throat> for example, the completion of an air transport agreement was the key to direct air connections between Canada and Turkey. <clears throat> Today, Turkey's location is strategic for business and its hub connections by carriers such as THY Superb. Direct THY flights between Istanbul and Toronto, New York City, Washington, Chicago, <coughs> Houston, Los Angeles are easy, even enjoyable, and they readily connect Canadians to the Turkic states of the Caucasus and Eurasia. Turkey will grow this year at about 3.5%, not the breakneck pace of 8.5% in 2011, but 3.5% in 2013 is not bad and certainly better than most of its European neighbors. <clears throat> Automobiles and auto parts are Turkey's largest single export, and the Ford Motor Company's most efficient plant in the world is in Kocheli, Turkey. Projected infrastructure investments of more than $250 billion over the next decade in energy, transportation, earthquake-proof housing, predict strong government engagement to meet the nation's growing requirements. In 
investments not just in building, but in equipping hospitals, universities, water sanitation plants, a new regional finance center, power plants, rapid rail, and much more. Work for the, I work for the corporate members of the American Turkish Council. We believe in these opportunities and in commercial engagement to build the strongest possible bilateral relationship with Turkey. And I invite you to as well. Thank you.